Hello everyone, welcome to Future Cities Lab podcast. Here in Singapore, I'm your host, Andrew Stokels. Hi everyone, welcome to uh, the first edition of Future Cities Lab. Today we have Stephen Cairns here with us. Stephen is the uh, director of Future Cities Lab and also the editor of the second volume of Indicia. Indicia is the second volume of Future Cities Lab series of books collecting the research and work from Future Cities Lab. Uh, we highlight the book and also the larger mission of Future Cities Lab, what are the new methods of research the lab has pioneered in the eight years, why are these new scientific methods important for addressing urban challenges, also, how can design serve as a mediation in between the empirical research of urban science, the actual reality of places with their particular ecologies, aesthetic traditions, and cultures? So this podcast is an introduction to the approach of Future Cities Lab and the ways in which researchers from many different disciplines have come together to work on solving the complex challenges of the 21st century. So Stephen, welcome to the first official podcast of Future Cities Lab. Thank you very much for being here today. Thanks. It's great to be here, the first, the first episode in particular. So Stephen, in the book, you mentioned this idea of convergence, the notion that cities are actually becoming a lot more alike, not just the way they look and appear, but actually in the way that they're studied, uh, compared, planned. Um, there's a proliferation of rating systems, rankings in terms of livability, uh, productivity, all sorts of comparisons that are encouraging cities to actually become more alike because they're being optimized for similar Mm -hmm. uh, functions, innovation, competitiveness, these sorts of things. And urban science at the same time is uh, an emerging field that is focused on cities as core problems uh, you know, going forward in the next century. But uh, what are the limits to that? Uh, at Future Cities Lab, we're not just doing science, we're also doing a few different things, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's really, I mean, I think we all, um, anybody who's, who's, who, who reads the paper even, I think would, would know that we're inside something often called the urban age. Um, it's, 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 it's an era in a way dominated by a mega trend of urbanization. But along with urbanization, there seems to be a, a pattern of convergence of thinking about cities in, in more and more common ways. So again, for those of you who you, you know these statistics, but it's demographers tell us that by 2050, another two and a half billion people will be added to the population of urban areas around the world. So crudely speaking, we can translate that to say that's an additional 250 mega cities. So that's 250 more Jakartas or Manilas or Bangkoks, um, uh, maybe 500 more Singapores to take a more sort of plausible uh, uh, model. So alongside this incredible growth in urban populations and of course cities, new cities uh, built to accommodate them, uh, existing cities uh, retrofitted uh, existing e existing cities not retrofitted but straining in a way to, to accommodate um, all these extra numbers. There's an incredible growth in cities but that growth um, in the way in which cities are being thought about and considered um, doesn't seem to be matched. So there's a, this is a dilemma about, about future cities and plural cities. You'd imagine a growing plurality um, but in a way cities are being conceptualized and measured um, and accounted for there's also a kind of convergence. And that convergence is to do with many of the things you mentioned, uh, more and more common sorts of technologies, uh, more and more common urban solutions, more and more common uh, policy settings. And then finally, because of the growth uh, in the technological means to measure cities, and this is everything from satellites, which, which are, of course, um, um, are circling above us, uh, to sensors, uh, which are in, the, in, in our, in our uh, phones, which are with us um, on a 24-hour on a basis. You're combining this incredible capacity to measure the phenomenon of urbanization. And along with that comes the rise of various kinds of indices, uh, indices which of course are very significant and very important. Uh, but they also contribute to this, uh, in a way, convergence in the way in which we conceptualize um, cities. Right. So I'd, I'd give you a couple of examples. Famous famous indices, will be, of course, will be the Sustainable Development Goals, mm -hmm. um, but there are indices which me this measure uh, CO2 emissions, um, GDP, creativity, happiness, and so on. Now these are all very important because they offer incredible ability to compare one city and the other, so Jakarta, Bangkok, 
But what happens when you compare Jakarta and Singapore, for example? Uh, they can be compared ac according to these common measures, but in, in a way, the reality of those cities, their fortunes, what it means to live in those cities, what are the pressing issues in the urbanization of those two cities, is not captured at all. In fact, is often obscured by precisely those convergent, uh, convergent accounting systems. So we're very interested in the reality, the power of those convening systems, those auditing systems. Um, it helps us to say, well, how do you support a city uh, like Jakarta? How does a munip municipal authority of that city itself measure its own uh, progress and development? Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we have to think about cities as lived places. So the motto that we adopt to try and capture in a way this tension um, is sustainable future cities by science, through design, and in place. So it sounds like what you're saying is that the amazing proliferation of cities is not being matched by new analytical modes of understanding cities. Yeah, I think that's a crisp way to put it. I, I think that um, there are amazing possibilities with emergent uh, media and, and data analytics and capacity to store data and process data. Uh, but cities remain... Um, uh, at the same time, uh, they are, we're learning more about them as, a, as, as structural uh, conditions and uh, infrastructural uh, conditions, but they're also lived, and as soon as you understand an, a, a city to be lived and a neighborhood to be lived, um, of course it activates um, cultural dimensions, historical dimensions, uh, ecological dimensions, and so on. So we have to keep those, in a way, in the loop. It's not to, to, to pick sides here, it's simply to make sure that these are in dialogue. Um, and I think that puts the pressure on us to ensure that we stay alive to new ways of thinking about cities as the cities themselves proliferate. So new ways of thinking about them, new ways about representing them, um, and ensuring that we're not adopting sort of generic catch-all forms of data collection or representation or mapping or policy set settings and so on. So it's a creative process um, as much as it is in a way uh, uh, an analytical responsibility. And this has led Future Cities Lab to develop new methods, new tools, as it were, to research cities. Yes, yeah, so our interest in this particular issue of Indicia is to foreground the tools with which we think. Um, philosophers are very good at, at helping us understand the way in which technologies become a kind of scaffolding for the particular ways and the thoughts that we can have. So the thoughts that we have, the, the ways in which we can think creatively and analytically, of course can only be done by the available uh, media, the, the available technical media that we have at our disposal. You mentioned this uh, critique by Alul of the technical medium and the, the risk that by relying too much on technologies problems are actually beginning more problems, that we're essentially in a web of um, technical problems that were arising um, and created actually their own problems. Um, and then this also reminds me of this idea of path dependency. So cities are a prime example of this. Infrastructure has an extremely long uh, lifetime. Once you build roads and infrastructure systems, uh, those systems often last for decades or even centuries. And we're in this period of rapid urbanization, you know, there's this example, I think, from David Harvey's talk uh, about China where they poured more concrete in uh, three years, from 2011 to 2013, than the U.S. did from 1900 to 2000 in 100 years. So urbanization is happening very rapidly right now, much more rapidly than before. Um, but the effects of that will actually last perhaps even longer, um, longer than the process itself is occurring. So how do you design uh, solutions or think about challenges that cities are facing in more flexible ways when we are not even necessarily sure what the challenges will be mm -hmm. five years, what the technologies will be mm -hmm. a few years ahead of us. Yeah, well, it, um, that raises a whole raft of issues, I guess, that, that are really central to the reason that Future Cities Lab exists, but also why it exists here. Uh, we're, we're in Singapore, of course, um, which gives us, in a way, a sort of front row seat um, on the process of urbanization that's happening around us. Singapore itself urbanized very rapidly um, through the 60s and 70s um, and in a way is now a, a, a knowledge exporter um, uh, to the regions around it like, like China. Um, and so you're right, I mean Elul's interesting because he gives us a way of thinking 
um, about uh, the possibilities of the rise of technical solutions, but also their limitations. And again, as I said, he's also very useful for helping us think through the way in which redundancy and uselessness is central to the way we think about, we might think about alternatives. Um, so what's emerging in some of the work that we're doing here is, of course, we use the term design as a way of um, trying to link science and particular lived places. So design, um, of course, is already well known as a discipline, but we've tried to, in a way, recast it as a particular kind of practice that can shuttle backwards and forwards between science and particular places where policies and actions, in a way, have to be lived and, and, and dealt with. Um, and in that framework, there's a range of different sort of projects, some of which are looking at new ways of doing, using bamboo and alternative materials, for example, to bypass, in a way, a dependency, mm. deep, deep dependency on uh, steel reinforced concrete, for example. Um, other colleagues are thinking about autonomous vehicles. Again, a widespread, a, a widespread uh, sort of international sort of theme now in urban studies. Uh, but also trying to overcome this profound dependency on on um, on the combustion engine and 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 the car. Right. So a lot of these emerged, of course, originally out of high, thick sort of fields of evidence. So evidence-based design, you could well say, delivered the car. Of course, there's politics and a whole range of other other decisions uh, relating to the emergence of that of that technology. But nonetheless, it was based on a certain kind of evidence. Um, so we have to be careful about those terms that exclusively uh, deploy technical evidence, uh, particularly when they can deliver such rigid, um, rigid ways of thinking about transport or water management or waste yeah. management and so on. One of the examples of the projects uh, here, Engaging Mobility, is looking at how autonomous vehicles will impact urban design in the future. So they're not looking just at the autonomous vehicles themselves, but also thinking about the larger ecosystem that those cars will be a part of. Um, that seems to be an example of, of planning for uh, challenges that might occur from the advent of autonomous vehicles. So yes. thinking about the city and how that will actually adapt uh, in the future. Yeah, exactly. So what, what's interesting about the autonomous vehicle um, group, they are increasingly thinking about these kinds of automated forms of mobility, but what that means for the urban form, what does it mean What does it mean for a street, in a way which emerged out of another sort of paradigm of mobility? Um, what does that mean for the different ways in which streets are used, uh, different ways in which uh, an urban, a piece of urban fabric might develop? I mean, all of these things are interrelated between sort of formal questions, material questions, and mobility questions. So that's the other, aspect of, of what Elul calls the aesthetic consideration, I think, and the way we try to use design in a way is a kind of horizontal medium that, that tries to link uh, what the work of the engineer and the hydrologist and the computer scientist and the urban planner, for example. So that's a very nice, uh, a nice clustering uh, piece of research um, that they do. How does design uh, factor into the research approach of Future Cities Lab? So design's interesting for us. Of course, it's, um, it has this kind of ancient history um, as, a, as a term and practice in architecture. Um, much, much more recently, it's been attached to, to urban uh, design, so the designing of uh, pieces of city and configuration of buildings with an urban dimension uh, applied. And then even more recently, it's been, in a way, adopted by engineers through this term design thinking. Right. Um, and in a way, we try to position design um, as, as one element of that, of that evolving um, sort of history. As I said, we're very interested in looking at the capacities of design to be a kind of go-between, uh, between the obvious significance of science and, and data for cities today, uh, but the also the, the undeniable fact um, that, that cities are lived in particular neighborhoods uh, in particular domestic environments. So design becomes in a way a way of moving backwards and forwards. One of the projects here at Future Cities Lab is the Waterfront Tanjung Pagar project, which uses design and research as a new method to uh, investigate the future city. Can you talk a little bit more about the Waterfront Tanjung Pagar project? Yes, yeah, so um, we, in a way we, we ask the question, what does it mean to bring 
a live, very large, complex design, an urban planning project into a research lab. So the Waterfront Tanjung Pagar project is a very large extension of Singapore's downtown region. Um, and it's complex because it involves land reclamation, uh, very high density, very sophisticated transportation systems. Of course, this is being worked out um, in uh, municipal planning authorities, in their offices. Uh, many consultants in the city and internationally are contributing to the development of the master plan uh, for the region. But the question we have is what does it mean when you bring a project like that into the context of a lab like ours where you have hydrologists and computer scientists, uh, geographers, um, ecologists and engineers working on their own work at the cutting edge and what does it mean when, when they start to interact and start to grapple in their own terms um, with, with such a sort of complex project. So for us that reveals um, a particular way in which design can help um, to interact with very advanced and sophisticated ways of thinking, very specialized ways of thinking, in a way interact between that research and the consultancy and the municipal authority master planning process. So we're very interested in, in, in developing a mode of design that can shuttle again, to use that word, backwards and forwards between uh, consultation and municipal planning, which of course is very close to policy mm -hmm. and quote unquote implementation, right. and of course the kind of base science that will allow us to think alternative ways of making sustainable high density cities like this.